Hugh Price, we were talking about this offline that this has taken many, many months to coordinate. Um, I want to reiterate again just how much I appreciate you know you taking the time to to do this. It's really an honor to to meet you and to be able to you know host this conversation. Welcome to the show. It's really great to meet you. Thank you, Dan. It's nice to be here. And I'm sorry things were a little bit complicated over the last <laughs> few months. <laughs> well, some things are worth waiting for. Um, I'd love to start you know, for you. And I, I know in doing research for this conversation a bit about, you know, what I think is probably the correct story related to how you got interested in existential risk topics and X risk uh, for short. But maybe it makes it might make sense to just start the conversation by asking you, how did you get here? How did you come to found the the center at which I know you were a co-founder? What got you interested in X risk in the first place? Well, um, the, the first thing to say is that I'm, I'm not any kind of uh, specialist in it. I'm, as you can see from my web page and so on, I'm, I'm basically just an academic philosopher mm -hmm. uh, with a long career behind me, uh, which about 10 years ago now happened to take me in the direction of Cambridge. And so in the summer of 2011, I was heading for my new job as Burton Russell Professor of Philosophy in Cambridge, mm -hmm. and I was taking the, uh, the kind of scenic route through um, to go to various conferences and give some, a few lectures in, in Northern Europe in the summer of 2011. And at one of those conferences um, in August 2011, um, it was, well, it was a, a lovely conference. It, it was, first half of it was on a boat, uh, a, a sort of adventure cruise line. We, and so we, we got on in Bergen in Norway <laughs> um, and sailed from there to Copenhagen. It, took about three days. And as we sailed down the fjord from Bergen uh, on the, the first afternoon of the conference, we, we had one of those sessions where everyone has uh, 90 seconds to introduce themselves. And this chap got up and said, hello, my name's Jan Tallinn. Uh, I come from Tallinn in Estonia, the same as my surname. It's very easy to remember. And I'm, <laughs> one, of the inf I, I, I'm one of the inventors of Skype. I thought, oh, that's interesting. I, I, I didn't know that there were going to be people like that at this conference. And I tucked that information away. And then three days later, when we were had arrived in Copenhagen for the second half of the conference, there was a conference dinner for organizers and so on, of which I was one, because at that point, I'd had a center in Sydney, which was also involved in organizing this conference. And so we were catching taxis from the hotel to, to the where the dinner was. Um, and I got into a taxi on one side, and, and Jan Tallinn got on the, in on the other side. Hmm. And I, thought, well, I remembered who he was, and thought, well, that's interesting. I'm in a taxi in Copenhagen with one of the inventors of Skype. I thought, this, this has Facebook potential. I can impress my <laughs> friends. But, I, but I'd better find something to say. I'd better talk to him. Uh, and so I asked him the obvious question, which was what he did these days, because I knew that they'd sold Skype. Hmm. Uh, I, I knew that he must be fairly wealthy. Um, and he, he he talked for about ninety seconds about his what he called his day job as a sort of venture capitalist angel investor. But said he said what I'm really interested in doing is getting people to think more about AI risk. And I asked him what he meant, and he started talking about ideas which were a lot less familiar in those days. Yeah, I'd heard about them, but um, I hadn't ever met anybody who took them seriously, especially not somebody who came from the computer industry himself. Uh, the idea that if we're not careful, then um, at some point AI might become extremely dangerous, uh, roughly speaking, because we haven't been careful enough to tell it what we want it to do mm. in the right sort of way. And so that was very interesting to hear somebody who uh, was not only took these ideas very seriously, but was also obviously committed to uh, trying to do something about them. And he wasn't wasting this uh, taxi ride in Copenhagen. He was using it to, <laughs> well, in effect to try and recruit me. Um, um, and so then I had another opportunity to talk to him later in the meeting. And uh, after the meeting, it occurred to me that I was going to be in Tallinn, his hometown, about two weeks later, mm. because I was giving some lectures in Helsinki on the other side of the Gulf of Finland from Tallinn. And, and the easiest way to get from Helsinki to Cambridge at that point was to go across to Tallinn on the ferry, which takes about an hour, 
yeah. and then take an easy jet flight from Tallinn to uh, Stansted near Cambridge. Uh, they had these weekend flights, which took a lot of young British people over to Tallinn to drink. I don't know if it still happens these days you know, after Brexit and so on, but in those days it happened a lot. So I could uh, you know, take advantage of the fact that at the beginning of the weekend, these flights, the return flights were largely empty mm. and, and, and fly to Stansted. Anyway, so I was going to be in Jan's hometown. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe this is an opportunity to uh, meet him again. And the other thing that occurred to me is that one of the people I already knew in Cambridge at that point uh, was also interested in um, the long-term future of humanity and, and possible technological problems that might arise along the way. Uh, and that man was Martin Rees, um, yeah. a very uh, distinguished uh, British astrophysicist. He'd been president of the Royal Society and uh, he was still master of Trinity College where I was in Cambridge where I was going to take up a fellowship. And I knew him a little bit through um, the sort of philosophy of physics, philosophy of cosmology circuit. I'd met him at a conference and he'd um, a long time before that, he'd reviewed my one of my books, which was about the hour of time. Hmm. So the thought had occurred to me that if Jan didn't already know Martin, then he should know him because they yeah. had these interests in common. Um, and maybe I could act as a catalyst to introduce them to each other. So that was a thought in my head. Um, and so I emailed Jan and said, look, I enjoyed talking to you. I'm going to be in your hometown in a couple of weeks. Uh, would you like to meet and have a coffee or something like that? So we ended up having lunch together and uh, I, I asked him if he knew Martin. He, he didn't at that point, but he knew of him hmm. and knew of his work. Uh, and so I raised the idea that maybe we could explore doing something in Cambridge to to encourage more people to think about these uh, this serious category of risk, especially technolo technological risks. Um, and so I set out for Cambridge with this idea in my head. I was calling it my, my Tallinn project, sort of ambiguously. Um, <laughs> and, and the first time I saw Martin at lunch at, at, in, in Trinity, I, I mentioned Jan to him and said, he seemed like a very interesting man. Um, he, I, what do you think about getting him over to give us a lecture or something like that? Mm. Uh, and, and Martin thought, oh, yes, that sounds like a good idea. And he said, I've, I've, I've got some people who, who might be interested in it coming to a, a, a dinner uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So he invited me along to the dinner, and I met somebody who ran a, a centre in Cambridge, an excellent centre called the Centre for Science and Policy. And he said, when I told him about Jan, he said, oh, he sounds perfect for a distinguished lecture series. We'll, we'll put, we put on the this person said, we put on the best um, public lectures in, in Cambridge, we'll invite him. And so in February the following year, February 2012, um, Jan came to Cambridge and gave a lecture called The Intelligent Stairway. I later found out that some people in, in the Centre for Science and Policy thought the topic was a bit flaky and controversial, hmm. the idea of you know, the future of AI and it becoming super intelligent and things. And so there was a bit of internal discussion within the organization before they decided that they were prepared to invite him. And that's a good indication of where the topic was at that point. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, that was the first time Johan came to Cambridge. I introduced him to, uh, to Martin. Uh, and by the spring of that year, 2020, we, I think my, um, Johan came again. And in any case, we were talking seriously about the idea of trying to set up a, a center. And we decided to call it the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, uh, or CSER, or CESER, as we pronounced it. Um, and we, we sort of went public with the idea in, in the summer of that year, um, set up a, a little web page and so on. Um, and, and by the autumn of that year, the, the university gave us some publicity, and so we got quite a bit of uh, attention from the news media, some of it, some of it more serious than others. Uh, the, I think it was the Sunday Times sent up a, a, a very interesting journalist called Brian Appleyard to interview us, um, and that was a serious piece. Um, some of the pieces were, were less serious. I was giving a talk a couple of months ago and, and found on, on the Fox News website a copy of their article from that time, which, of course, had, had, had the Terminator picture on it. And it was <laughs> the headline was something like Terminator Studies at Cambridge University. <laughs> 
anyway, um, things started to take off. Uh, in the following year, we got a um, uh, we, we we got a, um, a brilliant young man called Sean O'Hegarty, who'd been working for the Future of Humanity Institute um, in Oxford. Uh, which was the, the closest thing in the UK to an organization doing the same kind of thing at that point. Mm -hmm. And he came over uh, and with him as um, initially part-time and later full-time executive director, it sort of got off the ground and we started to attract funding. Um, and that's how Caesar happened. Um, so it's now um, 10 years old or so, um, and it's doing extremely well. It now has a couple of dozen researchers um doing really excellent work you you just mentioned this that um you know it it really it's only 10 years old but it seems like that's a lifetime ago that these issues at least to my mind were not a part of the western consciousness or just a component of the dialogue in media and culture in general and yeah, this is a, a very basic question that i'm sure you get asked quite a bit but you know, there everyone knows what you know risks are roughly speaking in in this world what is the difference between risks that we talk about and and maybe a better way to ask this is just to simply question what is existential risk what exactly does that term mean well as we were originally using it um we we meant um risks which could either lead to the human extinction or at least to the end of um I don't know, civilization as we know it yeah something which could cause a, a very long-term setback to um sort of, uh, human progress to put it in, the, in those terms of course you know you can ask all sorts of philosophical questions about what human progress uh, means but roughly speaking our, our view was that on the whole we've been doing quite well over the last um couple of millennia, uh, average, you know, things have been improving in a lot of ways on average. Uh, and we'd, we'd like that con to continue. Martin um, puts it very nicely. He, he says, uh, our planet has existed for 45 million centuries, but this century is special. It's the first when one species, namely us, yeah. has the planet's future in its hands. So we were interested in risk which could do serious damage to the species future and to the planet's future, because those two things are often linked. And we were particularly interested in understudied versions of those risks, because of course some of the risks were well known, like risk of asteroid impacts, and some people were studying that, or, or nuclear war. And, and those things have been studied uh, for a long time. Um, and we wanted to concentrate on the things which seem to be a bit understudied um, so, and risks from new technologies such as AI or synthetic biology or possibly nanotechnology seem to fall into that category. I and mean, of course, it, it, it wasn't really clear what the serious risks were, but that was partly because so little work had been done on it. Uh, and it was also true, um, and this came up in one of our early discussions, that many people thought of uh, some of the issues we wanted to discuss as a bit flaky. I, and I said that to, to Martin in one of the early discussions, and he says, well, exactly, but that's why this project is important, because we, we it, it, it may be that there are serious risks which are not getting attention because they're regarded as flaky. And we had to try and work out which were the serious ones and, and, and sort of push them towards the mainstream a bit so that they got more attention. And we knew that the, the sort of resources that we had to do to do that were primarily and most importantly um, resources of reputation, the reputation of Cambridge and um, sort of distinguished collaborators and distinguished advisors. So among other things, we started inviting people to be on an advisory board and lo looking for big names uh, and people whose reputation we could then use to attract other people people who might have initially been worried by the flakiness, but who would be reassured by having other big names on the advisory board before them. Yeah. So we, we, it was it was partly, we, we sometimes use the term academic engineering. We're trying to create a new mini discipline for the study of these risks. 
Yeah. And part of that was reputational engineering. I, I, I've drifted away from, you asked me about existential risks, and the, the, the point I forgot to make was initially we were using the term in a rather strict way to talk about um, things which were really um, could lead to human extinction or at least the end of civilization as we know it. I think there's been a tendency for people to use the term a bit less strictly uh, to mean something like catastrophic. Uh, you know, something which could do could be really really nasty uh, without actually leading to extinction or to the uh, serious damage to civilization as a whole. So, um, in a few contexts, um, it's important to make that distinction. But of course, it's a continuum, um, and um, <laughs> the the. The catastrophic but not quite existential risk needs study too. Yeah. So it, it's not it's not really important in my view to 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 draw that semantic line uh, very carefully. They're both obviously serious problems, and I I know you know this is part of the reason why I so wanted to meet you is that I think the work that you're doing and the subjects that you're really pointing to I, I don't know of any other subject that could be more that could possibly even in principle be more important than 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 x risks and i think for people and i you know i try to have conversations in general that are kind of introductory um long form chats about a subject matter that you know kind of has the perspective of someone that does not particularly have a lot of training or um experience in researching whatever subject is discussed and uh, you know I, you just painted a picture of what you know x risk and you know a a small deviation from that might look like but the you know to your mind what are the primary x risks that are there and if you could kind of paint a picture of what you know if the worst case scenario were to come into existence what what might that look like Okay, and, and here I should say that I'm not, I'm, I'm really just channeling the views of other people. Um, I'm, I'm, as I said uh, earlier, I, I'm really an academic philosopher. I'm not any kind of expert on this stuff. Yeah. My, my role in the, in Caesar was as a kind of catalyst and enabler. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, to, and to some extent, the, a sort of theoretical engineer in thinking about the issues <laughs> involved in, in how to set up such a center and field. Um, but having said that, um, it seems to me that there there are two big categories. Um, and uh, I think of them in my head as being associated with Jan on the one hand and Martin on the other. Yeah. Jan, as I said, thinks of AI as the most serious uh, possible, truly existential risk. I mean, he thinks that synthetic biology um, it certainly has serious dangers, but not at the existential level. Yeah. Whereas Martin, I think, um, was and is more worried about the possibilities coming from synthetic biology, in particular, the, you know, the possibility that, as he puts it, by error or by terror, somebody could accidentally create some new kind of microorganism or virus, uh, which could be um, uh, re really catastrophic. Um, now, I think I think I lean a bit towards the AI side. Mm. I think in the synthetic biology side, the chances of something really existential in the serious sense um, uh, are likely to be very low, um, because um, well, 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 partly because we we also. I mean, the problem is coming from the technology, but the scientific knowledge behind the technology uh, is likely to provide tools to to fight anything nasty that comes up. And so that while it, it's certainly true that it could be catastrophic, uh, it does seem to me unlikely that it could be um, existential. Whereas in the case of AI, there's a sense in which we're moving into unknown territory um, and we don't understand I mean, we, we don't understand the landscape of intelligences that are beyond ourselves well enough to make 
um, firm predictions. Now, that doesn't mean that we necessarily have a reason to be worried, but it does mean that someone who says very confidently, no, there's no probability at all of something genuinely catastrophic from AI, is, I think, guilty of overconfidence. Hmm. And so, I mean, I often say that in approaching these issues, uh, in, the, in approaching issues where there's a very high cost to a false negative, to wrongly dismissing something, as, as there is with this class of risks, it's very important to have a bit of epistemic humility and to pay attention to the views of a range of people with, with expertise in the field. And so the fact that some people with expertise in the field are seriously worried seems to me to be a reason to be a bit seriously worried. I mean, maybe not rank the risk as highly as those people do, but not dismiss it altogether. And so for those kinds of reasons, um, and because of the respect I have for, for, for people um, within the AI community who do take these risks very seriously, uh, I'm inclined to take them seriously too. Yeah. Even if I also listen to the optimists. And for 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 those that are worried, I mean, let's maybe we can take AI specifically here. What exactly are they worried about, right? What I think for people that are, you know, familiar with technology, you know, rely on technology to go about their daily life. This seems to be, in general, basically an unmitigated good for humanity in general. What is it about intelligence and AI and its you know, progress that seems to have maybe gone on in the last couple decades that seem to be making people, as you mentioned, that you respect and that are really giants in the field worried? What what are they worried about exactly? Okay, so at this point, I'm, I'm going to challenge, channel in, in particular, uh, Stuart Russell, who's a, a leading AI researcher in Berkeley. Yeah. Um, and um, among uh, sort of academic specialists in AI, uh, Stuart is probably the the, the the most outspoken of, of the, the the top level people, and I think I met, first met him about 2015 or something like that. Um, and his argument is a very simple simple one. Uh, it's and he he illustrates it with various familiar examples from fairy tales, you know, the you know story of King Midas who w wishes that everything he touches turns to gold and then has problems when he sits down to eat his lunch. Uh, or, or the Sorcerer's Apprentice, you know, who, who has, what, what is it, the, the, the magic broomstick, yeah. um, and, and then can't turn it off. Uh, and so Stuart's worry is that unless you specify, unless you get the goals right at the beginning, you may find that your AI system is doing something which actually meets the goals as you wrote them down, but isn't what you had in mind. Another of his examples is, you know, you, 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 you come home from work one day, the, the child minding robot has been uh, looking after the kids, and you find that it's cooked the family cat for dinner, because you didn't properly explain to it the difference between what you think of as regular sources of meat and, and family pets. Yeah. Um, so it's that combined with the thought that, um, at least for most systems of goals that you think of putting in a machine, the machine is going to have an instrumental goal of making sure that it doesn't get turned off, because it's if it's turned off, it can't achieve the goals that it's been programmed to achieve. Um, and so that leads to the thought that um, Unless you deal with that problem, then uh, it's it's going to be hard, very hard to stop a very powerful, intelligent machine, um, because uh, you know um, among its strategies for achieving its goals will be strategies for making sure that you can't turn it off. Yeah. Yeah. The the other one you said, I think the two the, the two primary, at least from your perspective, concerns that you have are AI and then some sort of engineered um, bioweapon. And I, you know, we all just lived through for a couple of years the ramifications of 
a new virus spreading globally that shut down the world for at least a year, a little bit more, and mm. killed millions of people. You know, in the worst case scenario, in a scenario that would, you know, by definition lead to an existential event with that potential um, major problem, what would that look like? You know, in, in your mind, what does a worst case scenario look like with, you know, an, an engine? Uh, I think it, it, uh, it, it, it's sort of like COVID, uh, uh, only um, thousands of times more deadly. Yeah. I was, we, we, we know how difficult it was to, um, to control the spread of COVID. Um, a, a few countries managed to keep it out for a, a few months. Um, but most didn't. And so if you had a, a, a new pathogen, which was uh, at least as good as spreading itself from person to person as COVID is, um, but much more deadly, then it's easy to imagine the kind of uh, problems you'd have. And of course, and, 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 um, we were lucky that, that for most people, COVID even before vaccines, for most people, COVID was um, relatively mild. It was the the, the group of people who, who were seriously affected by it uh, in large numbers were were mainly the elderly and, and a few people who were um, you know immu immunosuppressed or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, but but if if we'd had those levels of morbidity and, and mortality throughout the population at large. Um, well, I mean, obviously it, it would have been <laughs> catastrophic. Yeah. You just mentioned the word luck, which I think is, uh, an important, important word in having a conversation about this subject. And, you know, later in the conversation, I want to read, you know, arguably what may have been the luckiest event in the history of humanity, but in our own history with, you know, a, a, the th a threat of a, a virus, as you mentioned, that might be many orders of magnitude or orders of magnitude more dangerous than COVID. Have there been known cases in our in human history where we did get lucky with something like um, a new pathogen, a new virus that was contained or um, you know, did not cause the the real widespread panic and death that you know, you and your colleagues really do worry about with an existential type scenario. Well, I, 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 um, I mean, I feel even further out of my intellectual debt in talking about the, the, the history of disease uh, than in talking about AI. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know of any cases. Um, and I certainly don't know of any um, um, cases which are not natural, which, which are bioengineered. Mm. Um, I mean, who, who knows? There, there, there may be cases, but of course, a lot of that stuff is secret. Yeah, there's a. I, I in doing research for this conversation, I was relying heavily upon, and I, I'm guessing you've read this book or are familiar with it, the book "The Precipice" by Toby Ord. And there is a section in the book that um, really startled me, and I highlighted it, and I, I want to read it here shortly. Um, it, that book is, you know, discussing many of the issues that I know you and your, your coworkers are, are deeply concerned about. And this is a, this is a story from history that's from 1962. And I, I just want to read this. First thing I want to read is the dedication of that book, which again is called the precipice. And the, the book is dedicated to, and this is a quote to the hundred billion people before us who fashioned our civilization to the seven billion now alive, whose actions may determine its fate, to the trillions to come, whose existence lies in the balance. <clears throat> and this is the quote. It's a it's a bit long, but I think is worth the time because of the, just the magnitude of this moment. And I, to my mind, how you know unknown this moment in our history really is, and um, how little people know about a, a man who may have essentially saved humanity from annihilation. And this is the quote. 
It is only in the last century that humanity's power to threaten its entire future became apparent. One of the most harrowing experiences, one of the most harrowing episodes has just recently came, come to light. On Saturday, October 27, 1962, a single officer on a Soviet submarine almost started a nuclear war. His name was Valentin Savitsky. He was captain of the submarine B-59, one of four submarines the Soviet Union had sent to support its military operations in Cuba. Each was armed with a secret weapon, a nuclear torpedo with explosive power comparable to the Hiroshima bomb. It was the height of the Cuban Missile, Cuban Missile Crisis. Two weeks earlier, U.S. aerial reconnaissance had produced photographic evidence that the Soviet Union was installing nuclear missiles in Cuba, from which they could strike directly at the mainland United States. In response, the U.S. blockaded the seas around Cuba, drew up plans for an invasion, and brought its nuclear forces to the unprecedented alert level of DEFCON 2, next step to nuclear war. On that Saturday, one of the blockading U.S. warships detected Savitsky's submarine and attempted to force it to surface by drop, dropping low explosive, low explosive depth charges as warning shots. The submarine had been hiding deep underwater for days. It was out of radio contact, so the crew did not know whether war had already broken out. Conditions on board were extremely bad. It was built for the Arctic, and its ventilator had broken in the tropical water. The heat inside was unbearable, ranging from 113 degrees Fahrenheit near the torpedo tubes to 140 degrees in the engine room. Carbon dioxide had built up to dangerous concentrations, and crew members had begun to fall unconscious. Depth charges were exploding right next to the hull. One of the crew later recalled, it felt like you were sitting in a metal barrel, which somebody is constantly blasting with a sledgehammer. Increasingly desperate, Captain Savitsky ordered his crew to prepare their secret weapon. Maybe the, maybe the war had already started up there, while we are doing somersaults here. We're going to blast them now. We will die, but we will sink them all. We will not disgrace our Navy. Firing the nuclear weapon required the agreement of the submarine's political officer who held the other half of the firing key. Despite the lack of authorization from Moscow, the political officer gave his consent. On any other of the three submarines, this would have sufficed to launch their nuclear weapon. But by the purest luck, Submarine B-59 carried the commander of the entire flotilla, Captain Vissily Arkhipov, and so required his additional consent. Arkhipov refused to grant it. Instead, he talked Captain Savisky down from his rage and convinced him to give up, to surface amidst the U.S. warships and await further orders from Moscow. We do not know precisely what would have happened if Arkhipov had granted his consent or had simply been stationed on any of the other three submarines, perhaps Savitsky would not have followed through on his command. What is clear is that we came precariously close to a nuclear strike on the blockading fleet, a strike which would most likely have resulted in nuclear retaliation, then escalation to a full-scale nuclear war, the only kind the U.S. had plans for. Years later, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense during this crisis, came to the same conclusion. No one should believe that, the, that had U.S. troops been attacked by nuclear warheads, the U.S. would have refrained from responding with nuclear warheads. Where would it, ha where would it have ended? In utter disaster. Ever since the advent of nuclear weapons, humans have been making choices with such stakes. Ours is a world of flawed decision makers working with strikingly incomplete information, directing technologies which threaten the entire future of the species. We were lucky that, we were lucky that Saturday in 1962 and have so far avoided catastrophe, but our destructive capabilities continue to grow and we cannot rely on luck forever. I, yeah, I don't know if you've read that book, Hugh, but I'd love to, you know, in reading that very long passage, get your just general response to that moment in history and the threat that still remains for all of us related to nuclear weapons. 
Um, yes, I, 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 I know Toby, a um, very impressive man, very nice man too. I, I'm embarrassed to say that I haven't yet read his book. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I know the, the story of Archipop. I, I didn't know all the details. I didn't know that, that he was a higher ranking officer uh, and that that was why three consents were required on that particular submarine. Um, but the the excellent um, there's another organization in this space, a very uh, effective and prominent one called the Future of Life Institute yeah. um, at MIT. Uh, and they were set up, I think, 2014, uh, a couple of years after Caesar. Uh, and some of the people involved were also on our um, advisory um, panel. And one of the things that uh, FLI did a few years back now was to set up a, a regular prize for people who've made an extraordinary difference to humanity in saving um, millions of lives. And the first one or the second one, they wanted to award to Arkhipov, or they couldn't award it to Arkhipov himself because he passed away some years before. But they contacted um, his daughter uh, and brought her to London. And so we had a, um, a ceremony in London um, where um, Archipov's daughter and, and her son, Archipov's grandson, were present and uh, were were given this award. And um, it's, uh, so somewhere I, I have a selfie with, with Archipov's grandson with, with a picture of his grandfather on his submarine. Hmm. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very well aware uh, of, of that story and how lucky we were. Um, yeah, so I, I don't, I don't think we can find an example uh, within the technological arena, at least not yet, of a case in which we've had to rely on luck of that kind. I, I mean, in, in the kind of technologies we we're talking about before, and nuclear weapons are a technology, of course. But um, um, I, I, I think we're, we're we're still relying on luck to a considerable extent uh, in that domain, and of course, yeah. that's one of the reasons why the present situation. Um, is so concerning. Yeah. I think yeah, once you, for me at least, like reading that story and realizing, which I, I don't, I didn't really know until a few years ago, just how close <clears throat> we really came to a nuclear exchange. I, you know, it's very likely if that would have happened, I would never be here in the first place. Um, it is sobering in the, I think, the fact that a situation like this nearly very nearly occurred and i think takes the um the threat or should you know influence people to take the threat of an existential risk you know a bit more seriously you know we're, we're having this conversation in 2022 and i think for most of us we were kind of hoping that the end of covid would bring a sense of normalcy to the world and uh this year has proven otherwise the i think the topic of nuclear weapons has become and the threat of nuclear weapons has uh reared its head again because of the invasion of ukraine and the massive arsenal that the russians still have of nuclear weapons certainly enough to you know annihilate humanity um how do you personally, you know, as you mentioned, you're a philosopher. How how do you think personally about the nuclear threat specifically now, given the um, the context of the war and and maybe what you think is prudent in terms of you know moves by the West and how you know we might want to be framing this, given how high the stakes really are. I I, I don't think. Um... I, I don't think I have any uh, anything distinctive to add. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure that there's been you know, a great deal of thought going on in the background and probably communication going on in the background between Russia and America um, to try and um, you know, tr try and moderate the threat, as it were. Um, no. I, I don't think I really have any insights into how that goes. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 
I, I, I do know people, people with, with, with sort of insight in, into things like Russian telegram channels, um, that kind of thing, who, um, well, I'm, I'm thinking back a few months now, but who in the early days of the war were extremely concerned about the possibility that the Russians might need, might use nuclear weapons at some point. Um, but um, as I say, I, 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 I really don't think I can contribute to that conversation in any interesting way. Yeah. Do you, do you think that, I know you mentioned earlier that my, my take on your assessment of X risks right now is that, you know, AI and, you know, some sort of new virus are really the, you know, your primary concerns. Do you, do you also, you know, given what's happened this year, lump nuclear weapons in to that category now, or do you think they're not quite as serious as, as the other two? Um, as I said early on, when, when we were initially thinking about what CESA, CESA should work on, we thought we should prioritize the things which seem to be understudied. Yeah. Um, and um, in, in that category, the, the, the main candidates seem to be um, potential extreme risks associated with otherwise beneficial new technologies, such as AI and synthetic biology. And so, they, and we deliberately decided to give less weight to things which uh, were not understudied in the same way. Um, and, and the threat of nuclear weapons is in that category, um, as is something we haven't mentioned yet is the, the more cas catastrophic end of the possibilities associated with climate change. Yeah. Um, now, we deliberately decided at the beginning not to focus on those things, but there certainly has been some work in CESA. Um, as it's grown uh, on those kinds of risks as well. Um, and there are some people who are working in season now who have a background working for nuclear disarmament groups, um, things of that kind, uh, and also people interested in, in, in climate change. Yeah. And let's, um, let's, let's transition to that because I, I think that might be, you know, for a modern audience, a subject that they have grown up realizing is a very serious problem or could become one how do you think about the risk of climate what is a again not to be overly bleak but in in your mind what is a worst case scenario look like in that arena okay so um it's it's interesting that you should say not not to be overly bleak because i think <laughs> one of the one one of the issues in this arena seems to be that a lot of climate science, a lot of climate scientists feel under a lot of pressure not to be overly bleak. Yeah. And, there, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that they, they want to be taken seriously. Um, and uh, there's the kind of risk I mentioned at the beginning that, that uh, really catastrophic possibilities are likely to be regarded as, uh, as flaky. Uh, whereas if you pitch something within somebody's kind of, com well, not, not exactly comfort zone, but, but somewhere not too far away from their comfort zone, then, then they're more inclined to take it seriously. Um, and so there's a, there's a kind of sociological pressure to tone things down a bit. Yeah. Um, but, but one of the effects of that, as many people have noted, is that it's kind of dangerous because the, the sort of low probability really high impact um, risks, risk not getting discussed enough. Um, now, um, so I think this is a case where we need to do a little bit of work to push ourselves to be a bit bleak and to say, well, maybe these are not the, uh, the these are not the most probable outcome, but even if say there's only a 5% or 10% probability of this, it's something we should be looking at seriously and something we should have on our radar and in our models. Um, now that said, my impression is that um, over the last 10 years or so, um, the, the picture has got more bleak rather than less. And that some of the trends, um, have, things have been 
happening. Some of the bad things have been happening a lot faster than predicted by the mainstream climate models. So in some ways, um, my, at least my, my personal view is that I find climate change more depressing now than I did 10 years ago. I suppose another element in that is the, 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 the relative slowness of um, adaptation to deal with it. I mean, of course, there, there, are, there are some things to be optimistic about, like the, the rate of uptake of, of solar and wind power, for example, and, and the, the rate at which the cost of those things have fallen. Mm. Um, but I, no, I, I, I think the, um, you know, the, the, the case for being really seriously concerned about climate change is probably stronger now than it was 10 years ago. Um, you know, just just look at what's happening in in San Francisco today, if I understand correctly. Yeah, and even if the odds are you know five to ten percent, I think in general people understand that you know it, as a rough heuristic, it would lead to a much hotter world. What does that world look like? And I, I should add to this, you know, you you mentioned this during this conversation that you know you have a family, you have young. I I think. Um, you know, you have children and grandchildren, I, I, I believe. Um, yes. What, how do you think about their future? If, if it is the bleakest outcome and we have, you know, hit a, kind of a runaway path here where the environment is getting to a point where we can no longer stop and a certain type of outcome, what does that outcome look like? What would you tell your grandkids to, to brace them? <laughs> um, yes, um, uh, th that's a very difficult question. Um, I mean, difficult in, in two senses. One, one is the, 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 the kind of lack of expertise on my part. But the other, of course, is you know, how and under what circumstances do you have those sorts of conversations with children? Um, I, I suspect that um, in many respects, Australians are, are, are going to fare better than um, people in many parts of the world. I mean, I think that the, one of the effects quite soon is going to be temperatures which are simply incompatible with human life. Yeah. Um, and that will happen in countries, I think, like India and the Middle East. Who knows? It may even happen in, in North America and in some parts of Australia. Um, but it, I mean, it, it happens in where you have the combination of high humidity and high temperatures. Um, I really don't know. Um, um, and of course, there we're, we're only talking about the the. The, the span of life over the the remainder of this century. I mean, or the, a little bit beyond, if you're talking about the, the likely lifespan of my dear grandchildren. Um, but you know, some, some of the effects are not going to hit us until after the end of the century, like the the, the effects of um, sea level rise. Mm. Uh, I, I, I live in an area of Sydney, which is well above water level at the moment. Um, but a hundred years from now, it's not clear that it, it will be. Yeah. Certainly the park where I have my, um, I take my morning exercise will be underwater by then. Yeah. I know if, if I remember correctly in Toby's book, you know, he forecasts for, you know, from his mind, what he thinks the odds are that, you know, this next century or the century we're in right now, which I think is where the term the precipice comes from, comes from is that he believes that this actually is a unique and incredibly important time period for humanity to um, take seriously because of the fact that we have the capacity if you know there is poor decision making to eliminate the human story entirely and the precipice as I think he you know, paints the picture in the book is like walking up to, you know, a steep cliff that if you fall over, you will die. And 
the odds that he puts, I think that um, we will have an existential um, moment in the next in the in this century is one in six. And he says afterwards, you know, that's Russian roulette essentially. Do you, you know, personally, given the knowledge that you have about um, the areas of potential existential risk for humanity, do you personally have, you know, a probability? I know you said, you know, maybe five or ten percent likelihood that you know the climate issue might lead to an event like that. In general, in this century, do you tend to have a rough estimation as to what you think the odds of that might look like? Um, well, I, I haven't actually asked myself that question, but now that you have asked it, <laughs> let's qualify. Let's qualify my answer by saying, um, let, let, let's forget about the precise sense of existential, namely wiping ourselves, wiping us all out, and just think about the odds that at the end of the century, this planet is. Um, not a good place for humans to live. I, yeah. I think the odds are um, somewhere in Toby's ballpark. Yeah. Some, somewhere between one in 10 and one in five, I think. I think for people that get, you know, involved in any way in this literature, it's very easy to get de very depressed very quickly. And yeah, I know it is, there are people roughly my age who um, are of the view that it is irresponsible to breed um, given the the bleakness of the future. And I would be curious to get you know your views on that. You, you've spent a lot of time you thinking about these issues and how do you respond to somebody who comes to you and um, you know, probably their concern about the future is, you know, in their mind, you know, linked to reality and that they think that that is the responsible decision. What do you think about that? Well, let's, uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a call for them. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I certainly don't regret having uh, a, a, a child myself and having grandchildren it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, life is not without risk, but I, 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 I think we, 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 sh we should kind of be active optimists. That is, we should be aware of the risk, but at the same time, we shouldn't treat that as a, a, a reason for sitting around and doing nothing. Yeah. On the contrary, we should regard it as a, re a reason for action and to, to try to find the things that we're we're not doing that we should be doing. I mean, one of the things um, I talked a bit earlier about the the importance of avoiding false negatives in cases like existential risk, where, where, where there's a very high cost to a false negative. If you yeah. if you wrongly ignore a catastrophic risk and then get hit by it, that's obviously a very high cost. But there are there are things with the same kind of risk profile in the sense that there are high cost to a false negative, which are on the positive side. So if there are things that we desperately need, which we are not finding because we're not looking for them in the proper way, then that's exactly the same kind of mistake. Um, and one of the things I've been interested in, uh, so sort of initially coincidentally, but 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 then in a connected way, um, once I once the point about the risk profile occurred to me. So one of the things I've been following in the last ten years is a field sometimes called um, cold fusion or, or low LENR for low energy nuclear reactions, sometimes called solid state fusion. Mm. Um, and that's a field which um, became very controversial about 30 years ago when two scientists called um, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann uh, announced that they had a lot of um, electrolytic cells which were producing heat which they felt could only be explained by some sort of nuclear process. Um, and the, there were a lot of attempts made to to uh, re repeat their experiments and many people failed and well, I, I, I don't know if you know about this episode, it happened in, in 1989. Mm -hmm. But it's a field in which 
a small number of people at the time and since thought that there was something there um, and um, went on trying to replicate it, claiming um, a good deal of success in some cases. So it's one of these small but controversial areas of science. But the, the, the important thing about it is that if there is something there, then it's a potential new energy source, a carbon-free energy source, which is, of course, what we desperately need. Yeah. And if you desperately need something, then you should pay attention to it, even if the probability of finding it is low. That's exactly the same point as before, the high cost of a false negative. I mean, one of my articles about, about this, I say, I, I say uh, for hungry sailors, missing a passing island can be just as disastrous as hitting an iceberg. So if you desperately need something, missing it is, is, can be just as bad as encountering something which is directly bad, like the iceberg. And so one of the things I've been trying to do is to sort of focus on this particular case and other cases like it, where, where there are these kind of reputational factors which seem to be preventing people from taking a serious look um, at um, useful technologies. Uh, and I think this is probably not the only case of that kind. Uh, it may be that some of the, um, the the sort of climate mitigation technologies that we might need are in a similar boat. Um, you know, there are some people who think that we should be doing experiments seeding um, some areas of the ocean with small quantities of iron in order to promote plankton growth. Uh, with the idea that the plankton then get eaten and, and the effect is that a lot of carbon dioxide gets taken out of the atmosphere. I understand that the, I mean, the oceans in general are a huge sink for carbon dioxide. That's where most of it goes in the long term. And the idea is to speed up this process. Um, but again, the, the, the idea is regarded in some quarters as a little bit controversial and people who are working on these things find it a bit difficult to get traction. That's another case where we, there's at least a danger that we are missing um, something we desperately need, um, a, a sort of um, carbon mitigation technology. Um, and if we are missing it, then one of the factors, is, uh, there are these sort of sociological or reputational factors in science which influence um, what people spend their time on and where the money goes and things of that kind. Yeah. So I, 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 I've been interested in, in, in issues of that kind. Um, just last, uh, just um, in July, I, I went to the uh, annual conference of the, called the International Cold Fusion Conference. They have a conference most years. And this year it was hosted at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View mm. in, in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, and the organization hosting it were uh, something called the Anthropocene Institute, which is headed up by um, Carl Page, who's the brother of Larry Page, one of the Google founder. They have a very good institute, um, trying to um, sort of attract more attention to energy technologies, including the one I mentioned, but also new kinds of fission reactors, things of that kind. Hmm. You talked earlier about the fact that you know it's it's really focusing on actions that. Um, you think really, you know, matters at this point to focus people and to get people to start doing things. You know, what in your mind, in your you know, ten plus years of experience having conversations like this, in your you know, judgment, are the best actions that you know, roughly speaking, an average citizen can make to help to mitigate some of the risks of of X risk in general. Um, well, I think for for um, average citizens, the, the 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 areas where they can have most effect are, are the various things that we're talking about. There's, of course, in the cl uh, in case of climate change, because individuals can um, make a significant difference to to their carbon footprints, and, and this, this is all very well known. People should eat less meat, try to fly less, things of that kind. I mean, I think those two things are the, are the two biggest things that most individuals can do. 
then, you know, a slightly higher level, you then get into the sort of political arena, you can try and support political parties that are serious about doing something about climate change rather than ones that are in the pockets of the um, oil companies. Hmm. Uh, probably for um, the other kinds of X risks that we talked about, AI or synthetic biology, it's probably not much that ordinary people can do. Um, except, of course, trying to elect sensible governments. Yeah. Yeah. I know, you know, just personally in dipping my toe in these waters, it, it there is certainly a seductive aspect to just burying your head in the sand and not wanting to, you know, face some of this. You know, you're a human being too. Does Do these subjects, given how much of your, you know, recent life you have spent focusing on this and and working on these issues do do they get you down is this something that you know, you have had to learn how to you know kind of deal with on a day-to-day -day level or are you able to <laughs> handle it and get back to life as normal well, well it it does a bit i think the I, i'm not going to answer that question in my own voice i'm, I'm going to answer it in martin, <laughs> in martin reese's voice I, I i once there's somewhere there's a video of, of martin being asked that question question uh, and doesn't doesn't all of this thinking about risk uh, make him very sad and pessimistic? And he he quotes someone. I think it's Voltaire, uh, and the line is, "I tried to be a philosopher, but cheerfulness kept breaking through." <laughs> <laughs> so, in general, does that mean this does not, you know, tend to really darken your mood in general, or? Um, I, 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 I think so. Uh, I, and you know, of course, I have times when I feel pessimistic about this stuff, and it can be very depressing. Um, well, I'm sure we all know what it's like to wake up at three in the morning worrying about one of these things. Yeah. Uh, but on the whole, um, trying to be a, a sort of cautious, active optimist uh, is, is, is good for the psyche, too. It makes you feel better. Yeah. And, you know, I know, I know people, you know, in my former community, I lived in Austin, Texas, who are preppers, you know, they um, are in the event of some real global calamity or national calamity are getting their affairs in order to be able to survive um, pretty dire circumstances where they would be able to live off of their their own land if they if that were still available with the atmosphere is that something in general that you encourage people given how seriously you take these issues in general that people really consider for themselves that they have a a plan of action in case there is not a, you know an an individual existential moment where all of hum humanity is eliminated but where there is um, something maybe an order of magnitude less that occurs where civilization itself is no longer functioning and they are now responsible for keeping themselves alive. Is is that? Something oh, I, I think I, I I think the people I know don't have the financial resources <laughs> uh, to go in for much of that kind of prepping. Yeah, uh, I, I I understand that over in New Zealand, uh, you know, a, a few hours away across the Tasman Sea from from Sydney. There, there are now bunkers where billionaires, probably from Austin, Texas, perhaps people you knew, have, have, have built themselves bunkers. And so their plan is, is to fly to New Zealand at the first sign of trouble yeah. and to hang out there. Um, it reminds me, I once met a, um, a New Zealand AI scientist at a conference who, who told me that he thought that New Zealand would be the ideal place to test superhuman AI. And he said he had two reasons for that recommendation. One was that New Zealand was a sort of progressive country with a long history of social experimentation. And the other was that there was only one optical fiber connecting it to the rest of the world. So if something went wrong, you could just cut that. Yeah, seems like an ideal environment for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I know, I know. Just in in researching, you know, you and your own your own story for this, that 
it doesn't seem to me like you do a whole lot of interviews or a whole lot of long form interviews. And, you know, given that, you know, this may be one of the, you know, primary ones that you do for the foreseeable future. And let's say people are listening to this and they um, are alarmed and interested in your, your counsel, your wisdom. You've already alluded to, I think some of the pieces of advice that you might have of electing sensible governments and, you know, reducing their carbon footprint. What else, if anything, comes to mind that um, you might offer to, uh, you know, quote unquote, a normal person who is coming across these rather serious subjects and, you know, looks to people like you who are leaders in this field for, for guidance? Um, well, well what I think my you- first advice, my first advice would be not to look to people like me. Who are, yeah. who are, um, well, among other things, as I said before, I'm 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 not really a, a an expert on this stuff. I'm just a um, an end of his career philosopher who just happened to find an opportunity for helping to make some things happen uh, yeah. about ten years ago. Um, and I, I certainly don't claim any particular wisdom, but my recommendation would be: um, first, don't get completely depressed. <laughs> but second, don't do not do nothing. First of all, do the things that you can do personally, like flying less and, and eating less meat and dairy products. Um, and then secondly, if you want to do something more, then get involved with um, some of the organizations which are working in this space and working on, on issues like climate. Um, and of course, there's, there, there are wonderful, there's wonderful work being done by um, young people these days um, pressing for climate action I mean, groups like Extinction Rebellion and so on. Mm. Um, um, and there's, uh, uh, in, I mean, if, you're, uh, if, if your sort of taste is for really long-term thinking, then you could look into groups like Effective Altruism. Um, now, I mean, my own thinking is not driven primarily by that kind of very long-term thinking. Um, and I tend to think more in terms of um, making it safely through this century uh, and, and leaving it to our descendants in the next century to think about what to do next. If if there is a, a next, if we're um, successful in, as it were, leaving them a future. Um, but I, I, I know that many people are attracted to the, um, to, to the sort of more serious kind of long-term vision uh, that groups like effective altruism provide, and so I, I would encourage people to explore that and see if see if it works for them. Yeah, I know we're getting. Well, somewhat... but maybe I could say maybe I could say just one other thing, Please. and that's that you know if if you're somebody who's sort of inclined towards social action and that kind of thing, these questions are important, but they're not the only important issues, and so I, I'd also encourage people not to feel that they're somehow deficient if they're not worrying about this and they're um, worrying about something else instead. Uh, I mean, there's a, a certainly a lot of much more short term and much less catastrophic problems that need to be worked on as well. Yeah. I know we're getting close to the end of the conversation and I'd love to maybe, you know, spend the remaining time talking about, you know, other people in the field who you think highly of that you think are you know, approaching um, these subjects with a, a clear mind and have good intentions for uh, mitigating some of these risks. You, you've already mentioned a, a few organizations. Who are the people in your mind that are the real leaders that you know should be looked to for you know either wisdom or guidance or just information about being clear about what the X risk might be looking like in in this century? Um, you've already recommended Toby's book. I recommend yeah. that. Um, w- w- I think Will McCaskill's new book, what's it called? Something like, is it what we owe to the future? Something um, like that, I yeah. haven't read that one either, but, um, that's been getting a lot of, um, good press and I, I, I know Will, so I'd recommend that. Um, and then. Among organizations in this space, 
for, for people in, in North America, I, I recommend particularly the Future of Life Institute at MIT. It came up before. Take a look at their website and their activities. Um, it, it, it may be that there are opportunities to get involved in some of their things. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to, to, to start listing individuals, um, partly because I don't trust myself not to forget people. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, you know, I know you've already mentioned some of your own, you know, personal views on on this subject, but you know, maybe in closing, and and before we do, I I'd like to just thank you again for for doing this and taking time to talk about um, these you know important and seemingly bleak but necessary topics that that uh, we've talked about today. What would be your parting parting words for people um, related to this. And we've already talked about the fact that you know you have your own family. Um, it's clear that you're a pretty cheerful person, or at least it seems so. What, what do you think is the, you know, any additional words or suggestions for a mindset or attitude that you would have towards people you, you suggested, you know, doing what you can um doing the actions that are possible for you as a as an individual does anything else come to mind for you that you think is you know worth articulating to people who want to take this stuff seriously um but also want to enjoy you know their life and um you know is there a way to have both at the same time i i certainly think so I mean, different people will um, draw the line in different places. Um, I mean, people within the the effective altruism community that I mentioned before uh, are, are very serious indeed and very committed in a way I find admirable to using as much of their resources as possible to help other people and looking for effective ways to do that. Um, and some of the individuals we've already mentioned are part of that community and, and you know, give, give away most of their income um, to, to, to various sorts of charities, including in some cases, but certainly not exclusively, existential risk charities. Um, I, I don't myself sort of participate at, at that level. Yeah. Um, but I suppose my recommendation is that if you feel that you're not doing enough um, and you're looking for ways to do more, remember that, that small steps are helpful and small steps, not just in things that you do personally, but also in, in, in what you say to other people and, and what kinds of organizations you get involved in. Um, um, I mean, it's, a, it's a truism, but people are obviously much more effective when they get together and try to do things as groups. Yeah. And if I could sneak in one final question just to end with, you know, a note of hope or optimism, and I, maybe I should have asked you this earlier, but in your mind, what what are those slices of hope or slices of optimism if they do exist for you um, related to this field of yeah, you know, the possibility of us really making out of it out of this century or, you know, out of the next, you know, uh, couple of centuries to be able to um, survive and um, get out of these well, risk scenarios. Well, let's see. Um, I, I think several things uh, are probably going to be necessary. One is going to be um, coming back to the case we talked about right at the beginning and uh, the AI alignment problem. Uh, I, I think we're going to need a solution to that. It's not clear how pressing that is, but uh, I think AI is another case where the rate of progress has surprised a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so, so we need to solve those issues. Uh, on on the plus side, um, it may well be that AI will be helpful. 
for solving some of the other problems we have. And I know that's very much the hope of some of the leading figures uh, within the AI world, um, some of whom I've had the opportunity to meet over the last 10 years. Um, uh, I mean, there's this line, first we solve intelligence, then we solve everything else, which I think comes originally from Demis Hassabis, who's a very impressive and one of the founders of Google DeepMind. Mm. Um, I think for some of the other issues we've talked about, climate change and so on, I think that um, technological fixes are going to play a huge role, um, both on the, the side of replacing fossil fuels, things of that kind, um, but also um, sort of mitigation, uh, new ways of removing carbon from the atmosphere uh, or, or possibly reducing the amount of sunlight that hits the Earth's surface. Uh, and so I, 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 I'm on the side of people who think that technology is going to be very important. But I think that's a, a good side to be on in the sense that technological change can be very rapid as a look at history over the life, certainly over my lifetime, I'm sure every your lifetime too, shows yeah. us. Um, well. So they, they, you know, we, they, there are good sides to exponential curves too. If, if some of the things that are on those curves are things we need, like low cost carbon free energy. Yeah. I want to close just by thanking you for doing this conversation, but also for you know the years of work that you have given um to bring up what you know i think is one of the more important and in many ways interesting topics that people can talk about and i think through education more and more people can learn about what these risks really are and as you said earlier in the conversation take the you know steps that are possible for them to to mitigate some of those risks so um Thank you for doing this and thank you for the work. And um, obviously I, I am with you on, uh, I think sharing the need for optimism, you know, being clear eyed while also maintaining some of the cheeriness that you mentioned earlier. So um, thank you so much for doing this. It was really wonderful to meet you and to be able to talk about this subject. Thank you, Dan. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. Likewise. Thanks you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Keep Talking. If you're finding value in this podcast, please consider supporting the show via the links below on Venmo, PayPal, or Patreon. Your support helps to make these conversations possible.